I'd like to begin by saying thank you to Adam, Tom, Sean, Sylvia, and Pat for a thoughtful and intriguing discussion. Good morning again, everybody. My name is Roxanne McCoy. I am the president and CEO of Aspire Consulting Group based here in Las Vegas. I am also the president of the NAACP Las Vegas Branch 1111, and I am happy to join you today at, on, to, at today's summit on Nevada education. We know that many of our students are carrying baggage right below the surface. Byron Stringer, the director of the Toe Tag Monologues, would symbolically call this baggage a toe tag. Some of the toe tags can be removed, but others are the real markers that police, EMTs, and coroners place on the toes of those adolescents who die from shootings, bullying, drunk driving, abuse, and suicide. Byron Stringer's theatrical troupe addresses these issues by way of the toe tag monologues. Through assemblies at various schools, these young performers bring awareness to the issues that affect the lives of students. In most cases, after a school performance, students will approach the actors and share with them one of the performances they just heard that struck a nerve in their lives. The toe tag monologues performed at the inaugural summit on Nevada education in 2015. Their performance and message were so powerful, the College of Education invited them to perform again this year. I am pleased to present Byron Stringer Toe Tag Monologues. Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing this afternoon? Again, my name is R. Byron Stringer. I'm a retired Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Officer. I've worked the streets in Las Vegas for over 26 and a half years. And I've seen a whole lot of stuff. I've also been a D.A.R.E. officer. So I know what it's like when we're trying to do something to fix our kids, when we're trying to reach our kids. Police officers are what you call first responders. We're the first ones to show up and generally one of the last ones to leave. And if somebody's lost their life, I have to put out all that yellow tape. And if somebody's lost their life, a coroner will show up and give somebody a toe tag. But you see, I realize that a toe tag is so much more than something that somebody gets when they die. A toe tag actually is something that our kids have now, like drug abuse, like drinking and driving, gang violence, human trafficking, cutting, teen suicide, and the list goes on and on and on. A toe tag is real similar to a tick on the ACE exam. But see, some of our kids want to hide their ticks or their toe tags and pretend like everything is okay. But yet in the classroom, some of our kids, you can see their toe tags just flying in the wind. And it gets frustrating when you look at them and you don't know what to do because we, we try to force our kids into the old system, thinking if we keep doing what we've always done, that it's got to work because it worked for those kids, so it's got to work for all the rest of the kids. And it simply is not. Our children are dying, and we're running out of time to save them. It's imperative that we all work together, that we think outside the box, that we do something new. Just because we have done something before doesn't mean that it's going to work for the next kid. Let's do whatever it takes to save our children. Toe tags can come off. It looks like it's really light, but the truth is, is that this toe tag can weigh a million pounds. And that's the problem with our kids. You see, our, our kids, because of the million pounds, they can't accomplish their goals. They can't accomplish their dreams. They, they don't know how to dream. They don't know how to do anything. Most of our kids aren't even graduating from school. And they're using the drugs to cover up the pain of their toe tags. They're using drugs and cutting themselves and, and committing suicide and running away from home because of the ticks that they scored. And some kids are scoring ticks on their ACE exam every single day day over and over and over and over. I'm sure that if you've taken it, you probably got maybe two, three, four, five, but some of our kids are getting them constantly. 
Toe tags can come off, but we have to show our kids how to do it. The first monologue you're going to see today is Johnny. Before my family moved to this city, we lived in a small town that seems like a million miles away from here. Kids back home are different from the kids here. For one, they don't call you names or bother you. My parents said I was going to love it here. Boy, were they wrong. Dead wrong. It normally starts in the morning, a push, a shove, and then the name calling. Sticks and stones can break your bones, but words can never hurt you? Whoever said that was lying? Words can hurt you. They hurt me. There's this game the bullies like to play in the morning at the bus stop. It involves my book bag being thrown into the community pool. They did it so much, I started to keep my homework in my socks. I paid for a lot of school books. When it all started to happen, I was going to tell, really, but I was afraid of things getting worse. Why wouldn't they just leave me alone? And kids said lies about me and said things like I was a tramp. A tramp! And kids were texting these lies all over campus. Kids were on Facebook and Twitter every day lying on me. This one guy came up to me and asked how much for a good time and started to toss $1 bills at me like I was a stripper. I yelled at him. I told him to shut up, just shut up! How could they be so mean? I felt alone and used to cry so much that my eyes would be red and swollen. The only time I wasn't crying was when I was asleep. So... Sleep forever was best. I did it so I would never have to hear it again. I I wish, I wish I could do it all over again. I would tell somebody, anybody, I would tell somebody until they listen. My name is April, and I'm an only child. 
these other two kids who live with me are imposters. Security, somebody get these kids out of here. <sighs> Can somebody please make them go away? Things were just fine until they were born. And then I had to learn how to share. Now, I don't get this whole sharing thing. What's mine is mine. They get in all of my things all of the time. And, and please, do not let them do something wrong. I get blamed for everything. They don't do their chores, April's fault. They don't get good grades in school, April's fault. Even when they got the chicken pox. That's right, you guessed it, April's fault. They irritate me, but I would never want anything bad to happen to them. <laughs> Was that believable? Oh, hey, give me one second. I'm trying to set a record for most tweets in one day. If you've ever met my big sister, April, please just disregard everything she says. That's what I do, and that's what everyone does. Last week, we were playing basketball in my school. My team was the skin, so we took off our shirts. No big deal, right? My father told me later I better not ever take my shirt off at school again. I wasn't trying to do anything wrong. Miss Watson came by the house today. She said that she saw Junior's back. Said it looks like it's been beat with an extension cord. Of course, my father said, mind your own business. Said Junior was a badass kid and someone had to show him who's boss. After that, my father told us to never, ever take off our shirts again at school. Sometimes we couldn't wear shorts either. We had to cover up the bruises. Most kids my age are afraid of the boogeyman. Not me. I'm afraid of my dad. Shh. Don't, don't tell, tell anybody. anybody. Things, Things will, will get, get better. better. That's what Mama always told us. Mama rubbed Vaseline on the whip marks after Daddy beat us. I'd look her right in the eye and tell her, Mom, Mom, that hurts. But she couldn't hug me because I was crying all over. All she could do was cry. Daddy drank. He hid the bottles at the bottom of the trash can so that we wouldn't see them. But we knew. We always knew. Sometimes I wish I was just born into a different family. Mine's broken. Broken. To be shattered and crushed by grief. Not in working order or poor condition, but the funny thing is, when something's been broken all your life, you think it's normal. Before Daddy got home, we tried to clean as fast as possible, but, but there was always something that we forgot. We always, always did our chores, but it was never clean enough. It was like a ritual. First, he would start yelling at Mama. Sometimes he punched her in the face. Sometimes he choked her. Sometimes he beat her with an extension cord like he beat us. M Mama said when it happens, we should all run and hide. Never mind how much she screamed, just, just cover your ears. <laughs> One night, Daddy was beating Mama really badly. He threw her against the wall and started to yell. I'm the boss! I'm the boss! I heard my mom crying and saying, please, just put the gun away. I wanted to call the police. But he said if I did, he would beat me and he would never come back. You won't have a daddy anymore! And then I heard it. Pop! 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 I, I hid in their closet. When, when I saw the gun, I was terrified. Mama needed me to protect her, so... So I ran up and covered her so she wouldn't get hurt. <laughs> oh, Mom, it hurts. That night, 
My father killed my mother and my little brother, Billy. Shh. Don't, Don't tell, tell anybody. anybody. Things, Things will, will get, get better. Justice! <sighs> I'm tired of playing, I don't wanna... Yo, did you draw another smiley face on the wall again? You know what, you in, you in big trouble, bro. Watch when I find you, watch. <sighs> Have you guys ever played hide and seek before? It's all my little brother loves to play. It's his favorite game. Truthfully, most of the time, I really know where he is, but I just pretend I don't know where he is. Look around for a little bit, right? Then I yell out, Ali Ali Oxen free. That means you can stop hiding now, you're safe. You know, he still believes in like the tooth fairy and all of that, Santa Claus, the Easter bunny. It's cool though, don't say anything, you know, I don't want any more letdowns. It's been hard enough as it is already. I, um, I think I was like nine, like eight or nine at the time when my little brother was first born. He was like the tiniest thing I had ever seen. Then my mom, she's like, you know, you're a big brother now, you gotta be a good big brother and watch over him, protect him. So there I am, left alone with an infant in a crack house. No food, no bottle, no nothing. But it was cool, that wasn't all that bad. I mean, probably like two or three days at a time. And back then we learned how to, how to search the dumpster for food and all of that too. People left a lot of good stuff in the trash too, actually. Like, Half-eaten sandwiches, fruits, vegetables, kids. I waited there. I waited for that woman too. She told me she said, "She said I'm coming back for you. I love you, right?" She loved us. But um, anyways, my little brother he had got sick, and he wouldn't stop crying. I didn't know what to do, so that's how the police found us. We were hiding in the kitchen cabinet in the back. Um, I was scared too, I'm not gonna lie, cause every time I seen police, my mama was running from the cops, so I was, I was kinda scared. He must have known that too, cause he waited there for a long time. He was like, what's your name, son? I said, Martin. Then he asked me where my parents was. I got scared, I don't know, I thought he was gonna like arrest us and take us to jail or something, so I grabbed my little brother and I said, it's just us, it's just us, it's just us, right? And I think the officer thought I was saying my little brother's name was Justice, but I was really saying it's just us. It's just us, but my brother, he never actually had a name until that day. My mama never gave him a name, but that day he got one, his name is Justice. Just us. Foster care, it's all right, it's okay. That's not, that's not the problem. Just always sad all the time. People at my school, they try to call me an emo. But what, what do they know about me though, right? They not my friends. I actually only got one friend. And she just broke up with me, so. It's crazy, I told that girl everything about me too, everything. She left me for another dude. <sighs> to be honest, I wish, I wish life had a reset button because my life is messed up. Anyway, I wrote this goodbye letter. I figured that the Washingtons could take care of Justice now. He'd be all right. I don't think nobody gonna miss me anyway, right? I had um, put th these pills in my soda. I figured by the time I drank all my soda, I'd just be gone. I had my letter, I had my soda. Then that's when Mrs. Washington called me, Martin. So I go down there, see what she want. By the time I come back, that's when I saw it. My brother, Justice, wrote, he drew a smiley face on my suicide letter. 
And at that moment, I started laughing. I laughed until I cried, really. Because that's when I realized how much I still needed my brother and how much my little brother needs me, you know? If you, if you take the time to look around, you know, it's a lot in life to live for. And just think, I almost made the biggest mistake of my whole life. my favorite game to play and I'm the best hider because I can call in small spaces. Now that's why I don't ever want to be a grown up. Grown ups can't hide in all the good places because their feet are too big. <laughs> Miss Gonzalez told me I was the smartest kid in my class. I know how to write my name first and last name. One of these days I'm gonna learn how to read really good, even learn how to write in cursive like my big brother Martin. Please don't tell him, but sometimes when he's on the phone, I hide under his bed to listen to his conversations. He cries a lot, a whole lot. When Miss Gonzalez is happy with her class, she draws a gigantic smiley face on the board. Now that's when I got the idea of drawing smiley faces everywhere. I drew them on the walls, doors, and everywhere I could. Even though I got in a lot of trouble, it didn't matter. I was trying to help Martin not be so sad. One day, he was crying really bad and yelling to his girlfriend on the phone. I just knew I had to draw smiley faces really quickly to make him happy again. I drew on his paper this time. I don't know what he wrote, but sure made him sad. I drew the biggest, most biggest smiley face ever, but part of the mouth was smeared because Martin cried on it. I just knew he was gonna stop crying now. Smiley faces. Make everybody happy. I love Martin so much. He's the bestest, biggest brother in the whole wide world. I, I have a question for you. Do, do you think he's gonna be mad when, when he finds out I drink his soda? I, I bet he can't find me this time. I found the bestest hiding place ever. Want me to tell you where it is? children are dealing with trauma every single day and the thing is is that we've taught them how to lie we taught them how to smile and we've taught them how to pretend like everything's okay so when they show up in the classroom it looks like everything's normal they score really high in tests and it looks like they're playing with the other kids in the playground or or they're walking the halls they seem pretty happy or you come home and your your kids are sitting there at the dinner table and they seem okay they're on their cell phone like they normally do but on the inside, they have a toe tag. On the inside, they're scoring ticks every single day. The toe tag monologues is designed to help kids understand that they're not alone. It's designed to help kids understand that just because you have a toe tag on doesn't mean that it won't come off. If you talk to somebody, if you reach out, if you don't keep those secrets, then we as a village can help you. You'll be surprised when we do these performances, kids come up to us and they tell us about everything. They just open up. It's like, finally, somebody has given me a chance to have a voice. Our children have a voice, but we're not listening to their voice on the right frequency. See, our, the frequency that we're listening on is the one that we used to use a long time ago. And so a lot of stuff is going by us as a community. And our children are dying. 
and we're running out of time to save them. Thank you so much for allowing us to bring the toe tag monologues. Professor Big Boy. My name is Dr. Stephen Bickmore, and I'm an associate professor of college, uh, in the College of Education and a scholar of young adult literature. It was recently my privilege to be at a session with the toe tag monologues at the National Council of Teachers of English Conference just a couple of weeks ago in St. Louis. We stood in standing room only with teachers who didn't ask questions but sobbed, uh, who wouldn't leave when the session was over. And by the end of the day, they were invited to open a discussion of a town hall meeting in St. Louis about the crisis that many of our children face. Byron is fond of talking about teaching between the lines, and those of us that have spent time in the classroom understand that when students can act and write and discuss the issues that they live, then we have true education that goes beyond the script and touches the hearts of students. I'm fond of saying to my students, we need to know what the goals are. Then we need to work to get our students to meet those goals. But we can't reach our students where they are if we do not take the time to find out, indeed, where they are. Meet them where they are and move them to places that are safer, that are more constructive, and allow their voices to develop and to be heard. Authentic education is authentic when the students can answer the reality of their own situations. It's also my privilege, which some of you have been waiting for, to thank Mr. Stringer and the Toe Tag Monologue players and to say that it's also time for lunch. So there you go. It's time we'd invite you to enjoy lunch, which is outside, and have conversation with your colleagues and continue to have authentic conversations about what faces our children in Nevada schools. Thank you.